Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this drill this morning to get us started off. This is component four. Our presenter is Amber Emerson. Um, my name is Angela Brockman. I'm an NBCT here in Enterprise, Alabama. Um, I certified in 2018 in exceptional needs. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat today. I'm gonna to try to help Amber answer your questions within the chat. Um, we want this to be engaging and informative for you and fun. So um, as you have questions, uh, I believe we're all muted during, during the presentation, but as you have questions, certainly put those in the chat um, or um, if you want to raise your hand, uh, Amber, we didn't get to talk beforehand, but are you comfortable with them asking questions during the presentation? Yes, I actually have breaks where they can, so yeah. Perfect, okay. So um, like I said, we all know we learn the best when we're engaged and, and talking with the presenter and asking questions as they come into our heads. So feel free to do that. Um, here in just a second in that chat, I'm gonna put a link to the attendance form. Um, you only have to do that once per day. So if you did it this morning in the opening session, you do not have to do it again. If you haven't done it yet, do it now, and then you're good for the rest of the day. Whatever sessions you attend, you just have to do that attendance form once per day. Um, I'll also put a link to PowerSchool so you can get PD credit for your time today. Um, like I said, we're all muted uh, during the presentation, but please keep your camera on. Uh, we're gonna make this virtual experience as, as you know, real as we can. Uh, so keep your camera on so we can see, we can all get to know each other. And um, as you have questions, just put them in that chat box. And I believe that's all I need to cover. So look, look momentarily, I'll post those links for attendance and power school. Thank you all for being here this morning. Hey guys, um, I'm actually gonna start a timer because I can ramble and if I don't, we're gonna go over the two hours. So I'm gonna start that. So if y'all hear the ding in the background, my time is up. So um, I'm gonna start that. I'm also going to kind of exit out of the chat since I'm not, I'm really gonna be looking at that. My, my two helpers over here are going to, we also have Dr. Holly. Um, she's from the UA in service center. So um, she and Andrea are going to be helping me uh, greatly. And so I am going to um, exit the chat and I'm going to bring the, that's so you only see one person. Hopefully you can see my screen and, and not anything else. But yes, if y'all need something, please let me know. So we're gonna go ahead and just get started. Um, as she said, my name is Amber Emerson. I um, teach in Tuscaloosa City Schools. I um, have been a seventh grade teacher for a while. Um, this will be the first year at Westlawn that I teach eighth grade science. Um, I wear many hats in the district. Um, several of them don't really matter to national board, um, but I am, of course, like department head or mentor teacher. We also have ambassadors for our district, and I'm one of those. But the big thing that I wanted to let you know is TCS, Tuscaloosa City Schools, we have a leadership team, our own national board leadership cohort team, and I'm one of the five um, leaders on that. So we um, care so much about getting people to be certified. We have a um, cohort where we pay half of the people's or the, the NB2B's um, component fees and we give readers and mentors. And so we have a, a large cohort that we, we really try and, and get people certified. Um, I certified in 2019 in early adolescence science, and I'm what they call a microwave. So if you don't hear, if you've never heard this before, you're gonna hear it first today. Um, you can be a microwave and certify all four in one year, which is what I did. You can be a stovetop and certify two and two. So two components, or you'll do two components each year for two years. So you'll do all four in two years, or you can be a crock pot and do all four components in the three years they give. Please know that no matter what you are, there's no right or wrong way. The, it's not a race, it's a marathon. You're just trying to get it and, and get it in and, and certify. So um, I am a microwave though, and I scored a perfect four on component four, which is why they put me in this session and not component two or three, because um, I 
could help you with those, but I didn't score perfect on those. So that's why I'm in on this one. Um, but I tell you all of that to convince you, I promise you, you've got the right person in this seat on this screen to help you with component four. Um, I'm very passionate about it. To me, component four was um, the most clear cut. There's not a lot of gray area with component four, like there is in two and three. Um, and so I just like the fact that it, you just kind of go down a checkbox and check it and do what it says. So that's what I liked about it. Um, okay, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Angela's already said cameras on at all time if um, your camera works, if possible. That's just to kind of um, you just if you notice, I've already made the chat bot or the video screens bigger because I need to see y'all's faces um, to make sure that I, I'm not getting some blank stares. If you've got a question, ask a question. Like she was saying, I do have some um, break times in there for when you can ask for that specific piece we've communicated about. But if you do have one and you don't want to wait or you can't wait, type it in the chat box and one of these lovely ladies will be glad to answer that for you. Um, Mike's muted unless asking a question. That's just because of so everybody can hear me. I'm loud. I'm, I'm in the house by myself and I know I'm screaming, but um, just so everybody can hear me. And then please leave feeling good about component four. Please do not leave thinking, um, I don't know what she was talking about. I'm more confused now than I was before. I don't get this. Um, if, if you feel that way at the end of this, then I've not done my job correctly and get with me so I can clear up anything that, that I didn't clear to begin with, okay? So we're gonna do reflection time. We've got a poll that I'm gonna stop sharing and um, Holly is going to put a link in the chat box for you guys. If you can click it, it's just a one question um, poll question that is asking where you are with component four. So if you can just click that link and then fill this out for me, I'm gonna pull it up and see some of your answers. Um, again, it's just a one question. This is just for me to see how in depth I need to go. I don't want to tell y'all something you've heard 50,000 times. So if you could answer that for me. It says we need permission. Oh, try it again. Cause I've got some responses coming in. I've got several responses in, so. Did it work? You still need permission? Hmm. Still need permission. It says it's from a different organization. Okay, let me see. I thought I gave it to everybody. Hold on, let me, let me fix it. Hold on. I can open it, Amber. I know when you gave me permission, but. Yeah, it was, yeah. I thought I made it for anybody that had the link. Did I not? I can't see that side of it, but I can see that I have access to submit. Um, okay, so, okay, I see, I see. All right, let me go to it. I'll just fix it real quick and then add a new link. Not a big deal, give me one second. Technology's great until it's not, right? Uh, let me share it. Yeah, it says anyone with this link can be an editor. So let me, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'm gonna just tell y'all what it is and y'all can put a one, two or three in the chat box, okay? So it, the question literally just asked how familiar with you are comp four. I'm gonna share my screen so you can see the questions and then you can put in the chat box what you feel you are, um, how you feel, okay? So that's what we'll do. I don't know why it's not letting you guys because it says open to anyone. So no telling why it's doing that. So let me share my screen again with you. All right, there's the three questions, okay? You feel, you've read the instructions and feel pretty good. That can be a three. You're somewhat familiar, that can be a two. And what is comp four? That's a one. So on a scale of one to three, how well do you feel about comp four? Thank you for the responses. Perfect, perfect. So we've got a lot of ones and twos. That's what I've got in the, um, that's what I've got on the responses in there too. So perfect. So this is a great um, opportunity for you guys. This one, all of you one and twos, um, because I think we're gonna go really in depth with this. So I am glad to know that. 
All right, so let's get back to this. We're gonna go ahead and start. So what is comp four, okay? What is comp four? I know y'all can't see because of the, the chat box. All right, so if you have, like um, Melissa said, you should have the um, your standards printed out and hopefully, if you don't, it's okay, you have your component four directions printed out. If not, that's gonna be your homework after this, this session of the lunch is to try to get your um, standards and whatever component you're gonna be using the um, directions printed out, okay? So if you go to your directions right on page one, it actually provides you a definition of what component four is. And it says it provides you with the opportunity to highlight your abilities as an effective and reflective practitioner in developing and applying your knowledge of your students. That's a lot of fancy words, okay? Basically what you're doing is you are going to be using some verbs to tell about knowledge and information you gather and how you apply it. So if uh, in with national board, verbs are very important. I'm gonna speak a lot as though this is your very first component you're submitting. If it's not, you know this already, but if it is, it's important. So. Verbs are what you're gonna be looking at. What are they asking you to do? In component four, they ask you to describe, demonstrate, analyze, and reflect. Um, and so you're gonna be gathering a lot of knowledge, a lot of information on students, on assessments, on needs for yourself and others. And then not only are you gonna gather that information, you're going to tell them how you applied it. How did you use that information you gathered to make your students better, to make yourself better, to make your peers better, to make your school better. So that's really what we're doing with component four. Now it's going to cover um, some of the standards that you have. So when you have your entire standard printout, you could have anywhere from nine to 15 standards. For early adolescent science, I had nine standards. As you can tell, this component for me covered seven of those nine standards. So it's covering almost everything that I need to be able to show that I can do. Now, if you don't have your standards, Holly is also gonna put a link in the chat box in case you're like, what standards are you talking about? I'm not talking about like your Alex standards or your pacing guide or what you cover in class. I'm talking about the national board standards. So if you don't know what I'm referring to, Holly's putting a link in the chat box that you can click and it will take you to the website where you will be able to see um, your standards. So make sure you, that you know that, but you can see on mine, it's understanding students, um, curriculum and instruction, assessment. I'm not gonna read them all to you, but by the time this component meeting is over, you should say, oh, I see how we're reflecting back to that. I see how we're going back to that. So these are the standards that you really wanna make sure you're covering. Um, all right, so there are four main parts to component four, and there's one overarching theme. So we're going to cover part one, knowledge of students, part two, assessment, part three, your professional need, four is a student need, and we're going to touch on the overarching reflection part of this in this PD. Any questions before we dive into this? Chat box good. All right, here we go. So component or the part one is knowledge of students. So you are going to be using one group of students for this. Now for about 90% of us on this screen right now, one group is going to constitute one rostered class. There are one of my favorite reasons I love component four is because it is the same for almost every single certificate area. There are a couple caveats and I'm going to point those out as we go. One of those caveats were the standards. It covered seven of my standards. It might cover 12 of your 13 standards. So make sure you're looking. That's one of the small differences. This is the other difference that it can be. Again, for 90% of us, it is one rostered class. If you've got 32 kids in the class you want to use, you're going to be talking about 32 students. The exceptions for that are going to be if you're an exceptional needs specialist, um, there it tells you like 
if you are this and you pull out like three kids every Monday and Tuesday, and those are the, the group that you want to use, you can use a group of yours. Um, if you're a counselor, sometimes that group will be different. If you are an admin or um, you don't have your own rostered class, it tells you you can borrow a class. So this can be found on page seven of your component directions, right under where it says selecting a group of students. But if you are a general ed classroom teacher, it is a rostered class, okay? 51% of them have to be in your age, your age range. So for me, my age range was 11 to 15. The one group of teachers that this can get messy for is if you are a ninth grade teacher, okay? If you're a ninth grade teacher and you are doing um, the AYA component or certificate, then make sure that you have enough kids in that 14 to 18 range for that. If you're an elementary or if you're a middle school teacher, you're probably going to be fine with that 11 to 15. If you're elementary, this that really you should have your age range there. Um, but make sure that that age range is there. Everybody good with that? Okay, so what are you going to submit for the knowledge of student piece? The knowledge of student piece. You're going to submit four pages, okay? You're going to submit four pages. Two pages are a form that they're giving you to fill out, which we're going to come back to in a second. And two pages are evidence. We're going to start with the evidence piece because it, it's easier and it flows better here, okay? So, evidence pieces. Here is what we recommend. You can do this any way you want to, okay? Here's what I've seen is, is beneficial to people and what works. Because you have to give evidence on the entire class that you're using, sometimes if your class is up there, like 32 kids, 27 kids, it can get difficult showing evidence for all of them if you don't put it in some kind of user-friendly chart or data piece. So what we have recommended to a lot of people is to, to do like an Excel sheet and you're gonna put, this is for page one of your two pages. You're gonna put um, your kids on one side and then all of the information you found and then you're gonna color code it. And I'm gonna show you kind of something like that in a second. But you are going to pull out the what. So what are you actually collecting? You've got to collect some evidence based on your students. Now we all do this. The number one way we all do this on day one of school are surveys. We, at, we give a survey to our kids. We send a survey home to the parents, right? That can, be a, that can be something that you do to get to know your kids. But there are a lot of other things that I know you already do that we just got to have that proof. So you're just trying to see stuff about your kids. You're trying to figure out what are their likes and dislikes? What are their weaknesses and strengths in school? What hobbies do they do? Do they play a sport? Are they part of um, some other community in the school, like band or cheerleading? Do they, um, what are their test scores? Um, what, what is their home life like? Do they get to do homework? Are they watching baby brother and sister when they get home? So we're trying to find out all of this information to help us really be able to teach our kids. So that's the what we're trying to gather, just general information. What are their um, learning styles, things like that. How is exactly what you guys do. You send surveys out, you have conferences, you call parents, you have discussions with other teachers. So this is the what and the how you're gonna collect it. So there's a link, hopefully this one will work. It's a Jamboard. There's a link that Holly's gonna put in for you guys that goes to a Jamboard. And you are just telling me from whom in your school, in your community that you know, could you gather information from, from for your kids? Where could you gather knowledge about your kids from? So if you could go to the um, Jamboard, hopefully this is gonna work. And let's see if we can see some answers here. 
If you've never used a Jamboard before, you're going to go over here to um, right underneath the arrow and there's a sticky note and you just click that sticky note and you type on it and it goes on there. And I'll be moving some of them around so you can see them all. Yeah, former teachers, YMCA, EL teachers, parents, other, yeah, parents, past teachers, counselors, instructional coaches, church pastors. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yes. Employers. Yeah, if you've got high schoolers. Absolutely. All of these are great. Yes, that's what we're looking for. So please know that you need two different sources. Okay, that's what the directions say. You must have two different sources. I give the, the advice, if you've got more than that, you should be getting more than that. Okay, at my school, I use social worker, counselor, nurse, past teachers, parents, students, um, um, uh oh, I think somebody deleted everything. Oh, well, um, it's okay. You don't have to do it. It's fine. Um, use as much as you possibly can to get knowledge about your kids, right? So caregivers, families, other teachers, coaches, nurses, counselors, get test data, right? You can look at the Scantron test data or ACAP, whatever you guys are using. That can be something that you get to get your get for your kids. So once you have all of that, what are you going to do with it? Well, how do you showcase it? Again, we recommend a an Excel sheet and then you color code that Excel sheet. So you would put your kids initials or names on one side of the Excel and then you would put the topics like maybe test data, um, learning style, weaknesses and strengths. Do they have an after school job? Um, other activities they're involved in. Those might be your headings at the top. And then you're not going to get maybe, I know I didn't, I didn't get information on all 23 of my kids from the counselor. But what I did get from the counselor, she was like in orange and whatever she told me went on orange for the kids that she did give me something about. If, um, not all of my students turned in their parent survey, right? But the ones that did, I put in pink and that was whatever the parents said about the kid. So you're not, you're gonna get information about all the kids, but you're not, you might not get the same information from, from other sources. So you might get, if you got 15 kids, 10 of them, you might get information from past teachers and seven of them, you might get information from the counselor and 15 of them, you get their student survey back, right? So just color code it, make it easy. Now, remember, all of this is just one of those two pages of evidence that you get. The other two pages that you're going to submit, oh, well, the second page to that evidence is now you actually give an example. So maybe you, your second page of evidence is a screenshot of one of those surveys that a parent or teacher did. Maybe it's an email chain you've got going on on one of your kids that are having a hard time or has been a frequent flyer in the principal's office. So you're commenting back and forth with the past teachers. Uh, maybe it's photos of you having some kind of dialogue with the kid or a script of a dialogue with the kid. Maybe it's a log that you're using when you meet with kids. So your first page is that graph or that chart, I've seen pie graphs, bar graphs, whatever, but the first page would be a chart outlining all of the kids. And then the second page of evidence is more of an actual example of said evidence. The other two things that you're gonna, or the other two pages with this that you're gonna submit are two questions on a form that they provide to you, okay? They're gonna provide this form to you. It is, in the back when you download your um, directions and it says the group information and profile form, okay? There's two questions to this. The first one, describe the information about the group of students you collected from multiple sources and how you collected it. Translation, what did you collect? How did you collect it? And from whom did you collect it? This can be numbered, bulleted. It can be your normal English standard writing. You're basically just saying, I collected blank from blank through this way. So I collected um, 
I collected students' likes and dislikes from a student and parent survey on that I that I sent out the first day of school. Like that that can be a way that you you tell me what you got. This we're not analyzing it. We're not telling numbers. We're just strictly telling the how, the who, and the what. Question two is now you're describing the group of students you selected based on that information. So translation, you're gonna reference that info about this group. You're gonna tell patterns, trends, data, anything. So it might look like this. Based upon the information gathered, 12 of my 15 students are kinesthetic learners. You're not gonna tell what you're doing with that yet. You're just giving the fact. Nine of my 22 kids have an IEP. Two of my 27 kids have an RTI. Last year, two of my kids missed more than 40 days of school. Like just whatever information you gather. 26 of my 27 kids have extracurricular activities. What is the data you found? Again, this can be bulleted. This can be um, numbered. This does not have to be your typical um, English style paper. So you're going to get two pages to fill out that form. So you get two pages to answer two questions and you get two pages of evidence. Questions on knowledge of students. Remember, if you got a question, ask a question. Okay, as we're collecting that data, um, do we need to then describe every single component or like trend that we noticed or just give like enough to fill up the two pages? So that's a good question. So there's going to be a fine line of, of a, if you, if you are looking at the right, like if you're categorizing stuff, you're going to have just a finite amount of information anyways. But if for some reason you're like, I don't know how I'm going to fit all of these trends in there, then yeah, you're going to do what's pertinent. Because remember, if you write it on this page, you better be prepared to discuss it in the written commentary. So if you feel that it is relevant to what you're about to do, how you're about to assess students, how you're about to... Um, to find a student need, how you're about to teach a unit, then yes, put it on there. But I'll give you an example. When I did mine, I thought I was going one way with this and I asked kids um, if they'd ever been out of the state. I was like, okay, let's just ask them that. Have they ever been out of the state? Well, they told me that, but it was not, I, I never ended up using it. So I took that question and I did not use it in this component. It was great information for me, but it wasn't no nothing I needed to put in my written commentary so I didn't take up space on my on my chart. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, so like if it's not going to connect to something in the future, there's no need to include it. Correct. But there's the thing. You might not know what's going to connect in the future, right? So ask away. Ask as many questions, get as much information, get as many people involved. Like I ask coaches things, but I never use the coaches information in my written commentary because it wasn't pertinent to what I was going to write about. So yeah, if it's not pertinent to what you're going to write about or what you're doing, hold that in, put it down in your soul so you know how to better teach your kids, but you don't have to put it as evidence. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Can we see a sample spreadsheet? I, I, unfortunately, I don't have an example because I can't show you mine because once you submit something, it is NBCT's um, work. So I can't show you an example of one um, just because I can't show you mine. I, of course, I don't have anybody else's, um, but I, I, can't, I can't show you mine. I'm sorry. A Angela, did you have something? I was just going to ask that same question that um, someone asked in the chat about us seeing a spreadsheet. Yeah, I, I don't have a sample one um, because, like I said, I, I can't show you mine. Um, and so this is just the what we've done with TCS is this has just been the best. What I can do is tell you, like, if you open up Excel, um, the side, if you have a roster class of 27, you can use their, um, like you'd put name in your A1 block, right? And then below it, you're going to list all of the kids' names. You can use their first names. I used initials, okay? So I just used like K.J or A.M. And then on my top row, I had like six or seven um, topics. 
One was test scores, okay? Like above average, below average. And I went down the test score one for math and English. Um, I, once I gave the surveys and I talked to people, I kind of put it all together. So like one of my topics might be um, um, learning styles, okay? And then you go in and because you got this from a student because they said, hey, I learn better when you read to me. Well, that's auditory. So I would have put purple because that came from the student and I would have put auditory. And then I would have said, okay, but the parent said this student learns best by doing. So in pink, I'm going to put kinesthetic because it came from pink. And then I have like a little um, data box where the, the scorer can say, oh, they got this from, a this is green. So they got it from the counselor. So it's really just organizing it and making it, um, user friendly for them to be able to see, but it's going to be up to you what you what you make your categories at the top. Any other questions? Again, I'm sorry I can't show you an example. I, um, I will know for next time, maybe I can make a sample one and show it. Maybe I can do that. Here's what I'll do. I've got this link that um, I'm to my PowerPoint that I'm going to have Melissa send out to you guys at the end. And what I can do is I can go in this afternoon after I'm done with all of my sessions and I'll create a sample one and it's going to say sample across it, but I'll create one and put it in behind this slide so that you can see what I'm talking about. Um, that way, when she sends this PowerPoint out to you, it'll be there. Okay, that I can do that for you. I, I just I don't know why that didn't cross my mind. So I will make a sample chart. Does that work for everybody? Yeah, I got you. Any other questions about knowledge of students before we move on to assessments? We're doing good on time. All right. Assessments, maybe my stuff out of the way here, so. All right, so now why did we collect all this data? Well, we collected all this data so that we could then make lessons and assessments based upon what we know about our kids, okay? So hear me, I know some of you, just like me, we've been teaching for a while and it's so nice that each year if we're teaching the same thing, we can just go to our filing cabinet, pull out that manila folder with our previous assessments and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. What I'm telling you is you might have to reinvent the wheel here for this component for yourself because technically every group of kids you get are going to be different. So what worked last year for your kids might not work this year for your kids in assessment purposes. Maybe you had a whole group of honors last year and you could give an essay style test. But now the class you're using right now has 15 out of 18 IEPs in it, and that's just not going to work. So we got all this information. Now we've got to make assessments that are built and tailored to our kids we're using. Okay. Now in your standards, one of your standards should be assessments. So if you're like, what am I going to make? How do I do this? Go to your national board standards, find the one that's labeled assessments and read through it. It's going to be your guide to what you should be doing, how you make assessments, okay? You're going to pick one unit. It's going to be a total of 15 pages. This whole thing you're going to submit for the assessment piece. One unit. And of that one unit, you're going to make, you're going to supply a formative assessment, a summative assessment, and a self-assessment. We're going to go through all three of these. Now, if you have a unit that lasts 10 days, you theoretically should have 10 formative assessments, if not more. They're asking for one. I've had this question multiple times. I gave 10, I, I gave three formative assessments in this unit. Can I just show all three? No, you may not. It's asking for one formative assessment one summative assessment at the end and the self-assessment, okay? Now these can be teacher created or pre-made. Now I got asterisks there. If I could put fireworks behind pre-made to make you understand that I don't like this word, I would. 
the directions say you are allowed to make a you are allowed to use a pre-made test i tell my candidates do not do this because when you get to the evidence piece that we're going to talk about in a second you cannot provide a copy of that assessment because it's copyrighted take your favorite pre-made assessment create your own tweak it make it your own and use it it can have some of the same questions some of the same formatting but you're gonna have to make it your own so that in the end you're showing more evidence okay so i'm not telling you that you can't because the directions say you can i'm saying you're going to show a lot better evidence with a teacher created than you are a pre-made okay so at the bottom i'm not going to read all of these to you because we're about to go through it but what you're going to submit for the assessment piece are listed. It's a total of 15 pages and we're about to run through them. Okay. The first one is an instructional context form that they provide. They provide this. Okay. First question it asks is to describe the unit. This is your whole unit. All right. Short sentences. You, you can, I think I did mine in four sentences what my unit was on. It was on the cardiovascular system. I explained what key words we were using in the cardiovascular system and why we were going to, what, what the unit covered. We're not talking, because you got one page for this entire, these entire questions, okay? So short to the point, what's the unit? What are you expecting out of it? Describe the unit objectives. This is for the entire unit, okay? You're probably not going to showcase all of these units in your formative or all of these objectives in your formative assessment make sure they're all on your summative though so if they're not on your summative don't put them here all right so you want to make sure you have that these can be in bullet form they don't have to be some miraculous paper and then the last one question it asks is to describe why the selected assessments are appropriate this is where you want to use most of your space because you got to talk about all three types your formative your summative and your self assessments. Why did you choose this way? What did you do? Well, I noticed that 10 out of 15 kids were kinesthetic learners. So my summative assessment was a project, a hands on project where they had to get up and move because I knew that they learned best that way. So I assessed them best that way. All right, something like that. Why did you do it? Um, so this is based on the knowledge of all the kids. All right, you're gonna you're gonna create this unit. And once you get your knowledge of students, it should be obvious how to do this, okay? Meaning, if, you're, if your information about your kids say that they struggle the most with reading, then I would not give an assessment where it's a whole passage and they're reading, right? I would say I gave them chunks or I gave them a few sentences and I did this because they struggle with reading, right? So you're doing something based on the kids. Why did you do it? And what was your reasoning behind it? All of that is on this context form. All right, types of assessments. Um, there is another link to a Jamboard. And I'm gonna stop sharing so we can pull that Jamboard up. It's the set, it should be the second page as long as it didn't get deleted with that other one. If it did, we'll just skip it. But it should be page two right here. If, you'll, if you click the little arrow uh, up on the Jamboard. So a lot of you are, putting it, uh, or a lot of y'all see this blank page, go to the second page, and it's broken down into formative, summative, and self. She can put that link in the, for the Jamboard in there again. It's just page two. And I want you to, I'm going to give you about uh, three minutes. I want you to tell me what would be the, oh, let me share my screen so you guys can see it. Um, what would be an example of a formative? What would be an example of a summative? And what would be an example of a self-assessment? Hopefully you guys can see that. So I see a couple of questions in the chat box. I'm going to um, I'm going to stop sharing for a second because I want to look something up.
So I'm looking, um, someone in the chat box said something about art might be different. I don't know if you're talking about a rostered class that would be different, but I'm actually looking at it and it, it, it's not different. If you're talking about the group, it is, um, one entire rostered class for art. Now I'm guessing that's what you were asking me. Um, like I said, I have not seen many that are different with that, um, class exception except for the the teachers that don't have an, a whole class um so if that's what you were referring to with the art i'm looking at your directions and the directions for both early adolescence and aya say a class is one entire rostered class and you are not allowed to combine or switch it and 51% still needs to be within that age range. I'm hoping that answered your question with that. Um, and the other question I just saw was about, can you use the same unit? Yes, so you may, you, I think it tells you in, I'm gonna look at the, the little black box that's in here. It tells you, um, you can use the same, I think it's whatever unit you use, you can only use it in one other component, but you can't use the same lesson. So for example, I use cardiovascular system with both um, component four and component three, but like I did not use one was like a whole group video where we were doing Nearpod notes and we were going over the, the pieces of the respiratory system. And then this one was the whole unit and more about the heart. So it was the same unit, the cardiovascular system, but it was completely different lessons. So I hope that answered your question on that. All right, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. Um, don't worry about the Jamboard if you didn't get it, I'm about to show and we're gonna go over it. Um, so not a big deal if you were not able to share it. Okay, so I was asking you the types of assessments, okay, the types of assessments. Yeah, okay, so exit ticket, yeah, formative, exit ticket, chalk talk, Google Classrooms, a poll, thumbs up, thumbs down, Venn diagram, perfect, summative, unit test, ooh, I love museum exhibits, ACAP, um maybe that could be a summative yes um remember that's going to end up being something that's copyrighted and that's not something on what you taught now if you're pulling questions from acap and creating your own test fine but remember those are still going to be considered copyrighted because they're it's their questions and it's all of their tests you could take one or two and tweak them a little bit and make them your your own test but that summative test needs to be like based upon something you taught portfolio love it project yeah self-assessment okay end of lesson reflection three two one google form rating yes all of those are great so we're going to delve into these a little bit more here i'm closing my chat box again people so if you have a question all right so formula assessment let's start here so you've got that one page we just submitted about the overall unit information. Now you're going to have two pages on a form they provide for just the formative assessment piece, okay? It asks you two questions for two pages. The first one, describe the assessment, including purpose and appropriate use, student population for who you gave it to, how was it assessed, how was it administered, how did you use the results, um, how'd you score it? Okay. So again, this is factual. This is not, I did this and then I noticed this. So I changed this. This is just, what'd you do? What was the assessment? What am I going to be looking at when I look at the evidence? Question two is about the self-assessment. Okay. Provide context. Now I've seen this done in two different ways because even though I said that this is the most clear cut component, this is the question that has the most gray area to it. Provide context for the examples of student assessments. I have seen people provide that context on the self-assessment itself. Here's why I chose the self-assessment. Here's what you're gonna see. Here's what I did. 
and I've seen it done the other way, which is what I did. And I spoke on the students I chose to show the self-assessment for. So it can be done either way, okay? You can combine both of them if you want to. But you're just, you're gonna end up showing three self-assessment examples at the end of this as your evidence. And you gotta tell them what, what you did and what they're looking at. So you can either talk about, okay, I did this self-assessment. Here's what you're seeing. Here's how I gave it. Here's when I gave it in the class. Here's what I did. Um, or you could say, here are the three self-assessments. Here are the three students I chose. Here's why I chose their self-assessments. One has an IEP and, and I needed to make sure they were really getting this. And I, I made this self-assessment this way for them. So you can, you can do it either way, okay? Two pages to answer those two questions. The second part of this is your, the actual formative assessment. Again, it can be teacher made or pre-made. So this is not a form they gave. This is something you're gonna come in after those two forms and attach. You're going to attach the actual formative assessment. Now, if your formative assessment is longer than two pages, take page one from this student and page four from this student if you want to. It doesn't matter. They just want two pages of examples of that formative assessment. My formative assessment was one page, so I got to show two students whole formative assessment, all right? It's just whatever. Now, notice here, I do not recommend a pretest. I do not recommend a pretest as your formative assessment because how does that show what you just taught them? It doesn't. It shows what a previous teacher taught or it shows what they're coming into the classroom with that had nothing to do with you as the teacher. I do not recommend a pretest as a formative assessment. I know in the directions it says it could be, but people that have tried this, they run into, well, I didn't teach this stuff. So I, I don't, I didn't know. Like, so I would recommend it, the formative assessment come after you've taught a piece of your unit. Not telling you what to do, just giving a recommendation. Common question, should my actual formative assessments be blank or filled out? The answer is the same, no matter who asks it. What shows more evidence? Does a blank formative assessment show more evidence or does a completed formative assessment that you have given vital feedback on and handed back to the student, does it give more evidence? That's rhetorical for you to think, but that's the answer to, should this be blank or filled out, okay? So those are your next two. So, you, so we've already went through five of the 15 pages. We've had our general form about the unit. We've had the two forms for what the uh, formative assessment is. We've had the actual formative assessment. Next two pages are data from that formative assessment. You gave this formative assessment, what'd you learn? Charts, graphs, pictures. Has to be formative assessment data from the entire class you pick. And remember, a formative assessment is not graded. I got two platforms I stand on in my district. I'm a leader of MBCT, and the other one is standard-based grading, okay? Formative assessments are not to be graded. They should not be put in the grade book. You should assess them, and the kids should know how they did. But if you're grading formative assessments in your classroom, do not put that in national board because a FA should not be graded. So make sure that you're not like when I did it, you, you could absolutely put check marks or you could put a smiley face or you could put four out of eight, but that four out of eight should not go in the grade book, okay? Because this is practice. Why are we grading a kid on practice? So make sure that you show data. This is the one where you might not use all two pages and that is totally okay, all right? You might just use a page. You might use a page and a half. It is okay if you don't use all two pages. All right, next up is the self-assessments. This is still under that formative assessment piece, okay? These are the last three pages of this. When you do your formative assessments, you can absolutely have three, you can give the entire class the same formative assessment. You could pull three of them and provide those as evidence. Or you can give 19 different formative assessments if you've got 19 different kids, all on the same, thing that you just taught, but maybe you make them different for each kid. You differentiate for each kid and that's totally fine, 
okay? And you pull three. Or maybe you give this one to your high kids and this one to your average kids and this one's to your kids who are struggling and you have three different ones and you pull one from each. Totally fine, okay? Doesn't matter how you do it. Um, I did all three of the same because it made my life easier, right? I made a, a friendly formative assessment that it would work for all of them because there's a lot of other work that's going on and I just didn't, when I did all four in one year, I tried to make it easy. So I did all the same one. Doesn't matter which one you do. I tell many people that you should think of this formative assessment as a checkpoint, not for you, but for the kids. The kids should be able to do this formative assessment, then self-assess themselves and know what they should make on that final test. There should be no surprises. So please do not do a self-assessment at the end of a unit. Okay, an end of the unit self-assessment is not what we're looking for. In fact, it even says that in the directions. Okay, a self-assessment should be in the middle of your lesson. You're the middle of your unit. After you've taught something, you formatively assess them. After they formatively assess them, you give them their, their, their assessed paper back, and now they're going to self-assess themselves. How did they do? Okay rubrics checklists conversations between you and the kid thumbs up thumbs down emojis yes all right i saw somebody raise their hand please go for it could a form of self-assessment like if i'm doing an essay um like i'm teaching them how to write an essay or um particularly a argumentative essay could a self-assessment be um like maybe i have a writing conference with them and that's a formative assessment and then they edit and revise and grade themselves via the rubric. Would that be an example yes, of absolutely. a- absolutely. That is an amazing self-assessment for a writing prompt. Yes, you give them, you create some kind of checklist, you meet with them and you formative assess their, their uh, essay. And then you say, okay, I want you to take this checklist back. I want you to go back to your table, look for them. Tell me how many of these things you find and grade yourself at the end. That's a perfect self-assessment. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? We're about to move into summative. So now's a great time if you have a question to ask about formative. All right. No, thank you for asking a question. All right. So, so uh, summative assessment. This is going to be at the end of the unit, of course, all right? This is going to cover all of those unit objectives that you put on that initial form, okay? So the formative assessment may be only covering one or two of those. The summative needs to have all, and this one's only one page. So they provide you a form you've got to fill out first, okay? Same exact question. That form looks identical, except it does not ask the self-assessment question, okay? Describe the assessment. What was the purpose? Who'd you use it for? How was it developed? How was it administered? What were the, how were the scores intended to be used? Now I'm gonna tell you, for mine, what I did on my summative assessment, I had a 100 point assessment, 50 points of those came from an actual test and 50 points of those came from a project that they had as a group project, okay? They had to pick out a, um, a I had a whole list of, of diseases or parts or ailments to the cardiovascular system. We had a huge cardiovascular expo, kind of like a science fair, only it was only on the cardiovascular system. And they had to stand by their project and explain. So I covered the whole big picture and then they covered a small picture on their own. 50 points came from one, 50 points came from the other. That was my unit assessment, okay? So you can do it however you want to do it. It does not have to be a test. It can be a final paper. It can be a project. It can be a video. It can be whatever you think your kids need based upon your kids, all right? Again, this can be teacher made or that bad word pre-made, all right? It can be either one, but just remember, I'm going to show you. An, uh, so the reason I don't like the pre-made is because a minute ago when I said to actually show the, the formative assessment or the summative assessment, you can't do that if you use a pre-made. Instead, you get those two pages to describe the whole thing, okay? I mean, think about that. If I'm a scorer, I'd much rather see it than read about it, right? In my opinion. Um, again, you're more than welcome to use a pre-made. And, and I hope that you can do it great. 
um, because I've seen people do it, right? I just know my personality and it would have been, it, would, it was better for me to actually show the actual thing, okay? Um, you only get two pages. Your, your summative may be longer than that. Totally fine. Just show two pieces. You could show page one from one student and page three from another student. Totally fine with that, right? Could be anything you deem appropriate. Common question again, should this be blank or filled out? Common answer, which shows more evidence, all right? Does a blank one show more evidence or does one where a kid turned it in, you gave some critical and important feedback, handed it back to the kid, does that show more evidence, all right? And then again, your last two pages for this are charts, numbers, pictures, data from that, that summative must be for the entire class. So total of 15 pages. Questions on assessment? I'm a teacher, y'all. I can do wait time. Remember, if you have it, somebody else probably has it. Okay, so English teacher, of course, here. Um, so my brain is going toward writing. So my formative assessment, I'm thinking, is like a pre-write. I, you know, I've taught them or showed them and, and taught them how to, you know, do what I'm looking for in an essay. And the pre-write shows kind of like where they are initially with it, right? And then I would have the the writing conferences would be my data for the for the formative assessment. And then the self-assessment, I'm thinking, like I said, would be um, that checklist or or hey, go back and revise and make sure you've done these things that we talked about in the writing conference. And then the summative assessment is like their final copy of their essay. Yeah. Is that appropriate? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, I'm pretty certain, yes, you can um, put you'll be able to, to get this video back. Um, usually what happens at the end of the conference, uh, so tomorrow she'll send out a whole document with all the links to everything. So you'll be able to go back and reference this. Um, okay, so yeah, I can address that. Um, so when you're putting things on pages, watch your, um, your certificate, directions because there are certain times where it tells you you can only put like for instance your formative and, sub and summative and self-assessments one whole one takes up a page okay so for example don't shrink if, if you gave a self-assessment and it was two pages long don't put front page at the top of the page and back page at the bottom of the page to show both pieces and then you would end up essentially having six pieces of evidence. They only want three pieces of evidence. So one self-assessment goes on one page, one goes on another. There are times where you can shrink. So like student of not, or knowledge of students at the very beginning, when I did evidence, I was able to show a survey from a parent at the top and a survey from the parent at the bottom. There are times they're in these boxes. When you get your things, always read these gray boxes. It tells you where you can shrink and where you cannot shrink. There are certain times where you can and certain times where you cannot. Um, can Pearson reading and mathematics indicators serve as formative assessments? So yes, anything can be a formative assessment, right? The problem would be, is that copyrighted? Are you gonna be able to show that as a piece of evidence or are you going to have to describe it? Okay. If it is not coming from your brain, it is copyrighted. Any other questions? All right. I'm going to check the time. We still have an hour. So I'm going, this is a great place. I'm out of coffee, okay? I'm going to give us just like a three minute break. I'm gonna grab some water, um, three minute break. 
if um, one of my friends will put a three minute timer maybe up, I'll stop sharing and we will start back. This will also give you, I can hear you. I'm literally just going to my kitchen to grab some water if you have a question, but three minute break. Um, I know as teachers, we don't get those. So go TT if you got to. All right, guys, thank you so much, Holly, for doing that. Um, we are going to continue on. Let me share my screen. All right, so moving right on. Part three is the professional need. All right, here's why we took a break. Because this next part had, can, but does not, have to have anything to do with what you and I just spoke about. It absolutely can, but it does not have to, all right? So your professional need. This is something that you want to take on to help yourself and your colleagues around you, okay? So, kind of giving it a break. I'm, I'm noticing there are a lot of people absent that are not at their seats. I'm just kind of giving it a minute. Just kind of giving it a minute. All right, so professional need. This is something that you want to take on to make yourself better for the classroom. It does not have to have anything to do with the group of students you used, doesn't have to have anything to do with what you did with assessments. It can be based on one kid, one student need that you 
you see, I have had people tell me that they made their example. They had three students in their class that were Arabic. So they wanted to learn some Arabic. All right, that's a student, that's a professional need. You did it to help some students, okay? Um, one of the big ones right now is technology, okay? Teachers are like, I wanna do some PDs to learn some te to technology to help myself to better my students, okay? Everything has to relate back to the students. So you can't just say, oh, you know what? All my kids are fine with reading comprehension, but I'm going, wouldn't it be great if we said that? All my kids are great with reading comprehension, but I'm just gonna do it because I wanna be better at reading comprehension. No, 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 no. You gotta pick something to better yourself, to better your kids, okay? And I've got some examples along the way and I will hear every one of your examples if you want me to, to see if it works, okay? Um, but some examples, technology needs, reading strategies, hands-on learning, grading techniques, um, whatever works for you needs to tie into a student need that you have found within your school somewhere. All right, what are you going to submit? The first thing is this description of the professional learning need form that they give you. You get one page, two questions. Describe a need for professional learning by yourself and or your colleagues that you identified as a result of your students, either a particular group or accumulated over time. So this could be, hey, I've noticed that over the 10 years of my teaching, all kids struggle with fractions. They struggle with how to do it. So I found some, some books and I found some PDs and I learned how to teach it hands-on. This was a need I needed. I needed to some professional development on how to better teach fractions because all my kids struggle with it. That's a professional need. So again, you are just telling what the need was, okay? The second question is describe the evidence you provide. So you're going to actually give some evidence about what you did. You've got to give evidence on why it was a need, how you helped it, what you did to, what you personally did, how did you help others, what did you do? So you're describing the evidence you're going to put at the end of this. So page one is the actual form they're giving you. All right, the next two pages are the actual evidence. Evidence on how you met the professional learning need. This can be meeting logs where you went to a meeting. It can be the PD certificate they give you. It can be um, a letter from a principal or a colleague. It can be, um, uh, I'll tell you mine in a second, but it could be participating in uh, book studies, all right? Whatever proof you have you did you did this professional need and you, you were trying to, to better yourself with it. Evidence on the impact of it on your students, okay? So again, you've got to show what the impact was. There might not be any and that's okay, all right? Hear me, there might not be any impact Write about it. Why? Why was there not any impact? Show your negative data. Show that they were here and then they came in here and you really wanted them up here. That's totally fine. Just show the evidence of what happened. What did you do? These can be charts, graphs, letters from parents, students, peers, principals, whatever your evidence is, okay? Bottom line, based on the data and information gathered about a particular group of students does not have to be your original what professional learning need did you need how did you pursue it and how did it impact students so one of the examples I'll give is is a small snippet of mine I did standard-based grading okay in my school we were in desperate need of a new grading system because what I was noticing was that the kids that were um falling well below grade level on the math and reading Scantron or ACAP, whatever we have now, they were sitting in my honors classes. The grades in the grade book did not reflect the Scantron data. And it was because teachers grade everything. And, and this standard-based grading set helped me really hone in. And by the end of it, by the end of a unit, 
my kids were not making hundreds on all the quizzes, hundreds on all homeworks, hundreds on all class assignments, but failing the test, coming out with an 80 because of all the fluff grades. They were failing a test and they had an F in my class and those were the ones I really concentrated on. And I was able to help and help and help. So I'm a big proponent of standard-based grading and a lot of it came from this. I went to conferences, I joined um, book clubs, I now speak at the conference. I did it in my classroom. I led a faculty meeting at my school. So remember part of it is how did you bring it back to your colleagues? I led a faculty meeting at my school. I gave them a survey in that faculty meeting. Part of that was my evidence of my fact of my PD, right? So all of these things can happen. Really think about this professional need is not just about you because this is a community. How did you bring this need back? What did you do? Maybe you just meet with your team and you're like, hey, I went to this PD. Let me tell you all some stuff. Maybe you make a PowerPoint and you send it to them and you've got an email chain where they looked at it, okay? So whatever you do, professional learning need, bottom line, what's something you need to better your students? Questions on professional need. On the evidence of uh, student growth, um, when you're talking about the charts and the graphs, so could I take, I'm wondering if this is gonna be a copyright issue. Could I take a star math score report or would I have to like take that data and make my own report using that data to turn in as evidence? Does that make sense? It does. Um, so you can absolutely use that data um, because you're not using a test and it's just the data at the end of it, right? You gave a test and now here's the data. You could take a, a picture of that data. That's their bar graph, right? So that I don't think would be considered copyright. Just be, now, I would definitely advise you to call the 227 teach or 22 teach number just to, to triple check me. But I'm pretty confident that that would not be considered copyright because it's not their test. It's just the data from their test. Okay. Thank you. Again, you could always do that yourself, right? If you are right. questioning. It, you could always take it and make your own bar graph so that you don't even have to worry about the copyright part. Right, right. That'll Thanks. take you all two minutes, yeah. The um, professional need, like you said, does not need to tie in with the other stuff at all, right? Mm -mm. So I teach 12th grade. So could my need be, or because something that I see my 12th graders needing is what to do after high school and whether that be completing job applications or college applications or whatever, um, I could do professional development on, you know, how to guide them through that process. Because we have a counselor, but she is so extremely overwhelmed with over 500 students. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's something I could do not have to do with anything that you've previously done. That's why component four is usually called the beast. Uh, basically what happens is that a long time ago, some of these were chopped up into their own components. And when they redid it, these four things kind of got lumped together and it's just all in one component now. So they don't tie in. You can tie them in, but, but I'm going to tell you, I highly recommend because I've seen it now with two candidates that, that did not take my advice and they did not certify. It was because they tried to put it all together and where that hurts them is that a lot of times you don't have enough evidence for each piece because you can't double dip with the evidence piece. So that's where I see candidates having trouble is where they're going to tie it into the beginning and they're going to make their student and professional need all tied together and then they run out of evidence and they're like well I don't have enough evidence for the student need because I use this on my professional and this on the assessment pieces I don't have any more evidence so I highly recommend making them different so you could absolutely do something like that what you're talking about we're about to get into the student need it might fit better with the student need right so um so yes, that, that works 100%. Okay, um, to piggyback off of that real quick, could profession, this professional development need to be like some like official professional development or could I meet with my counselor and show evidence that she taught me how to 
approach this or I met with local job places that said what they're looking for on applications? Okay, yes, perfect. It can, be it can be, I, my kids needed this, couldn't find a PD. So I sought out communicating with people in the city to try to help me. I reached out to 10 local businesses, had them come in as speakers or had them sit down with me um, and go over what are the things that they're firing kids for? How do they hire a kid? What do they look for in an interview? And I made this checklist for the kids. Absolutely that it does not have to be cut and dry PD. You can create your own, absolutely. I had a couple hand raises. Um, Go for it, whoever would like to ask me a question first. Um, I've, I'll uh, jump in here because this kind of relates to the question that uh, Randy was just asking. Um, so I, I'm in a similar boat where I have juniors and seniors and I was just wondering for this, this piece of it with um, professional need, you talked about the first thing you have to do is establish that this is a need. Uh, does that evidence of, of that need to be quantifiable? Like for example, something in uh, like student motivation for learning, that kind of sounds um, like what, what she was discussing. Yeah, so if you need something like that, like student, okay, so student motivation would be great, okay? Um, I think you could get some quantifiable evidence there. And, and here's where you would get that from. Get some, have a survey sent out to the teachers, okay? Make a survey through, through your Google stuff and say on a scale of one to 10, this particular group of kids that you're teaching right now, how motivated are they? On a, the next question, over the past five years on a scale of one to 10, has motivation increased, stayed the same or decreased? Like you could still get that quantifiable evidence. You see what I'm saying? Like this is absolutely, you're the expert. You know that your kids have lost motivation or your kids, you could even send that, that survey out to parents. Now you may only get 10 responding, but that's 10 pieces of evidence that you have, right? So it's how can you get that quantifiable of it? So absolutely, I love motivation. Um, now, again, I feel like some of these that you're giving me, as soon as we speak on student need in a minute, y'all are going to be like, oh, this should go under student need, right? And that's totally fine. But professionally, how you could say, okay, my kids are lacking in motivation. How can I do better to motivate them? What professional development things are you going to do to do that? So, and that's rhetorical. That's for you to think about. Just understand that that's the thing. If, if you say, this is my problem, what am I going to do to better this? I feel like motivation of students might be, that's a student need. What can I do for them to motivate? There you can bring in guest speakers. You can give them some hands-on things. You can show that's more of a student need, right? But you can totally flip that to a professional need. Just know your, your task is going to be, what do I do professionally to motivate the kids? Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Amber. Um, great information so far. Um, I'm concerned about overloading the kids with all these different surveys that I may come up with in my head. Um, to try to define their student need and this and that. Um, so when I'm crafting my beginning of the dump a lot of these different questions in there and then pull out from that survey what I need going forward as I build a student profile or as I determine a student need, is there anything wrong with, um, and I, you may have addressed this earlier, with tacking different pieces of, of questions in there that I may not need for my group profile? So let me make sure I understand what you're asking. You're saying that when you do your surveys at the beginning, if you see that there are some irrelevant questions to your written commentary for the knowledge of students, could you pull those instead and use them for your student need? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Great. Good. That will make it a little bit more efficient. And I don't want to, throughout this year, I don't want to feel like I'm like, I guess, badgering the kids for my own needs at different points that I want to be purposeful. 
with what I'm asking them. Yeah, you absolutely can. Now, now just to, to clarify with that, like, I'm going to tell you when I did mine, I came in in August telling my kids straight up, I'm doing this. You are the group, because since I did all four in one year, I got to use the same kids for all four components, and I made them part of it. So I would say, today is National Board Day. Let's get on it. We know what we're doing. And like, okay. even when I would do the videos, I would video every day. And I tell people this all the time, because I like cried in the middle of class when they did this. But like, I had videoed small group on Monday, and we tweaked it on Tuesday. And I got a different small group and did the same lesson just with my small group for day two. By day five on Friday, when I pulled that last group and I got done with the video, the kids were cheering. Miss Emerson, that's it. That's the video you used. That's the one I want you to submit. Like they took ownership with this, right? So please don't feel like you are going to hound your kids. Tell your kids up front, guys, I'm trying to be the best teacher out there there is for you all. I need your help in doing it. That means if I do something wrong, Tell me how I could have done it better because that's going to be a reflection piece for you. Tell your kids and just be honest and say, hey, I need y'all to fill this out again for National Board. It's a different question. They're going to take ownership and they're going to make your experience better for you. So yes, absolutely. Give them that survey. Take the one you don't like. You might find that four kids need something and you're going to do a PD for those four kids. Totally fine. But I also don't want you to feel like I can't ask my kids again to fill something out because I'm bothering them. I don't want you to feel that way either. You know what I mean? Okay, good. Thank you. That's exactly what I needed to hear. Yeah, of course. Um, so I saw would be creating a growth mindset be used for personal development. Absolutely. So really anything you guys throw at me, I'm going to say yes. My response is just going to be okay. How are you going to do it? How are you going to first show that it's a need? How are you second going to professionally develop yourself on that? And third, how are you bringing it back to the kids? So if you have an idea for all three of those, absolutely creating a growth mindset can be used. Um, with communication with parents. So again, yes. How is that a need? How are you going to professionally develop yourself? And how are you going to bring it back to the kids? Okay, this last question I love. Thank you, Megan, for asking it. Can this be a school-wide professional need that we are already doing as a faculty? Yes. My recommendation? No. Why? Because you want to talk about what you're doing. What are you personally doing to better yourself? Not what is the school making me do, okay? Not what is the school telling me I have to do. This is what did I choose to do because I saw this need in my class and how did I do it? You absolutely can use it as a professional need. But you're going to run into when you start writing the written commentary saying a lot of things like we or my school did or my school noticed. National board scores do not care what your school noticed. They do not care what we collectively did. They care about what you personally did. Okay. Great. Any other questions about professional need before we move into student need? Did I get everybody? Um, I know we haven't covered student need yet. I'm sorry. I know we haven't covered student need yet, but can the student and professional need um, be similar? Like, can they go hand in hand? So I'm going to answer that in just a second, okay? Okay. Angela, yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to kind of add, like, I totally agree. Like, you don't want to use as your professional need something that somebody besides you has identified and already started for your school. But back when I did mine, I, I just approached it as, as yes, I identified this need, but I wasn't the only adult in the building who needed that. And I, I made part of my component for basically how I, like I was coming um, out of being a special ed teacher, starting a position as our career coach, 
and I was getting my certification in special eds, exceptional needs for national board. Um, and my whole thing was that um, I needed to, to be more aware of what our special ed students, our at-risk students can do besides college. Yeah. And that was a school-wide thing. I mean, like all of us as teachers, you know, college, 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 and that's just, and so a lot of my component four was about professional development. I sought out for myself and then I shared that with yes. Good others. Part. Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier. Like, make sure it's something you can bring back because that's what I did. I went out and sought out the standard-based grading and then I came back and taught it to my faculty. Yes, that's right. Okay. So, so school, so school, a school-wide mindset is, is okay, but, but basically school-wide because you initiated it. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. okay. Yeah. Anything else? All right, let's get to the student need because I think we're about to muddy the water a little bit, okay? So student need. This is something that you will determine a student need. This can be a small group, a class, a larger group that requires advocacy or collaboration, okay? You might see that 10 of your, like I teach about 100 kids a semester or a year. I might see that only 10 of my kids need something and I might do it for just that 10 kids or we have 545 kids in our school. I might see that 100 of those kids need something, right? So it's it's whatever kids you want, what is a need you see they have? This can be academic or not academic, okay? And I'll get to that in a second. But based on what you and other stakeholders see that students need, how did y'all work together to solve it? So this could be related to academics, okay? But it can also be advocacy. I've heard people have that, um, somebody told this story and I, it always stuck with me that the um, like eye exam for their kids was not until December. And so these kids were going, some of these kids in kindergarten or first grade were going from August to December, never have gotten their eyes tested. And then they get to December and get their eyes tested and they realize, oh, they can't see. So that's why their grades have been so bad. So she worked to try to move that time up to September so that the kids wouldn't go a whole semester without being able to see and nobody knowing. That can be a student need, okay? I've had people tell me that their student need was doing a, a coat drive because they had so many kids that weren't coming to school with coats in December. And so they started doing a coat drive. It can be something like that, um, but it must show collaboration and it has to go outside the box. Again, like Angela was saying, this can be something you work on as a group of teachers, but when you write in your written commentary, your pronouns should be I did, not we did, okay? Not myself and my partners, not myself and my teacher next door. Make sure you're using the word I did in your writing. So just make sure that even though you're doing collaboration, it's I worked with other teachers, but I brought in an eye doctor to help or I called around to local businesses because my group noticed that kids were not able to do something after high school. They needed to know what to do. So just make sure you're watching those pronouns because they, they want to know what you personally did. But you do have to collaborate not just with your teachers, but with community members too, right? How did you how did you do this? And I'll show you some examples in a second. Um so you're going to have, again, the two forms that they are, that you're going to have the form that asks two questions. You get one page. Again, same questions. Describe a student need. How did you collaborate as, as a part of a bigger uh, community? So how did you collaborate with the school, the district, your community, a professional association? How did you, how did you collaborate? And then describe the evidence. So what is a need that you know your students need, have and how do you know it? and describe to the score what they will see in your evidence for this and how you help solve it. Now your student need does ask for one extra thing, not paper-wise, but question-wise, okay? So when you get to your evidence piece, remember the professional need, you needed two things, you had two pages. Student need, you need three things, but you have two pages to show it. You need evidence of the student need. How do you know the student needs it? prove that. You need how you collaborated with others to meet this need. How did you work with others to meet it? Prove it. And you need evidence on the impact. 
of how this worked. How did what you do help the students? Maybe it didn't, that's okay. Why didn't it? What can you do better next year, okay? So three things, two pages to do this. Your bottom line, what is a student need you saw in a group of students? How did you get with others to solve it? Did it work? How do you know? If not, what needs to come next? So an example for me that I did was this was my, when I did national board, this was the first year at the school I was at. And I was noticing that I had come from a more affluent school and I could throw out examples and kids knew what I was referring to. And when I got to this school, I was noticing that my same examples weren't clicking because my kids didn't have life experiences. I'm now in a really um, rundown poor part of our city. And I'm at the only hard to hire school in our district that just came out on the paper. Title one, like we're, we're at the bottom, right? We've got lowest test scores, highest discipline level. Um, and I was noticing these experiences, they didn't, they didn't have them. So my need, my student need was life experiences. That was literally my student need. Well, how could I prove it? Well, our test scores were low. I showed a log of how I tried to use examples and they didn't know what I was saying. They didn't know, they didn't know how an ocean and a lake were different or they didn't know, you know, a lot of the words I was saying. And so I took them on field trips. I brought in guest speakers. I used lots of examples. I did a lot of hands-on activities. We did a lot of videos. Um, and then my proof was I got a parent to write a letter saying how their child's vocabulary had changed, how they were coming home excited for science like they'd never been before. Um, I, there were emails from the people that I took kids on field trips to just showing I did this. Now, my test scores at the end of the year for the Scantron were better. Do I know that's particularly because of me? No, but guess what? I wrote that I had a part in that. My kids' test scores went up and I believe it was because I gave them life experiences, right? Um, going back to my professional need, my professional need by the end, yeah, things were better, but I didn't get any other teacher on board. Nobody else wanted to do it. I was the only one in my school that did standard-based grading. So in my written commentary, I wrote about how, you know what? I need more teachers involved if I expect this to work. And so I don't know that it's going to work. I, it worked in my classroom, but I only had, we're only talking about, you know, 100 kids out of 545. I can't do this for all of them because other teachers aren't doing it. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So your student need and your professional need. Now, someone asked a minute ago, can they go hand in hand? Yes, but I'm gonna give my same caveat. Be very careful doing that because you need different evidence for your professional need than you do your student need. So for example, if you go to a, a PD or you lead a faculty meeting or you have test scores, those test scores can only go in one of those sections. You can't use the same scores for your professional need as you can your student need. It has to be different stuff, okay? So they don't want to look and say, oh, well, I see all of these charts are the same here as they are here because your before and after would look the same, right, for both of them. So that's my only caution is make sure you have enough evidence to make them go hand in hand, okay? Any other questions about the student need? or compare and contrast student need and, and professional need. So I have a question um, about the advocacy part. Um, I'm the sponsor for student council and I don't, I don't wanna sound like I'm trying to come out easy on this, but I don't wanna reinvent the wheel either. Um, every fall we do a pin dodgeball tournament and we raise money for Christmas coalition, which in turn, works with the community members as well. Is that something that I could do for a student need because I'm helping to raise money for my students that I have, or is that too broad? I know that's not gonna help them in the classroom. I so, don't <laughs> I'm gonna say that my answer is not coming from it being too broad or not helping in the classroom. My answer is gonna come that it's something that you guys already do, right? Okay, that's what I was wondering, okay. I, I'm not telling you you can't, okay? Nowhere does it says that it has to be something that is brand new. But I'm gonna tell you again, for TCS cohort, we recommend to our candidates not to do that. Just because okay. it's not some, you might've thought of it 10 years ago and that's why you're doing it. And it was your idea and you've implemented it, but it's, 
not something new that you're incorporating. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Yes. I just wouldn't advise it. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm looking at the chat box. Um, Willie. So it says, can evidence of student need be written evidence or should I also provide supporting documents? Can you explain what you mean by written evidence? Like based upon your own, like, is it, I noticed kids did this, this, and this. Is that what you're asking? Like, what would be an example of your written evidence? I'm asking, am I just simply writing out, like describing it, or should I also provide supporting documents? No, no, like, no. Your, ev states? your evidence should straight up be evidence pieces, supporting document pieces. You can have some written part on there, but this should be a scanned in, um, a scanned in picture of guest speakers coming. It should be a scanned in pictures of some fundraiser you do. It should be um, scanned in evidence of a um, reading comprehension thing that you gave because the student need was reading comprehension. They should be actual pieces of evidence. So of the two pages and the three things I have to prove, am I shrinking documents to make it all fit on those two pages? Well, you can, but remember like your first piece is, um, yeah, yes, you can shrink those. You can put um, like two, two on it, as long as they can see, as long as it's visible, as long as you scan it in, you give it to a, a, a practice reader and they're like, oh yeah, I can see that. But if they're squinting and can't see it, then it's too small. But yes, you can use, um, you could put like, proof could be some charts or something up here or an email up here. And then um, your proof that you actually did something could be a scanned in uh, half a page of a sign-in sheet where you and your team met. Um, so yes, you can do that. All right, perfect, thank you. Okay, Randy, I'm sorry. So we focus on a school on college and career cover. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Randy. Um, so remember this, um, even if I was a science teacher and I noticed that my kids at a high school level didn't know how to go on, that's a student need. It doesn't have to apply to anything else I do. So yes, I could say, I noticed that my kids needed to know what to do to be career ready or college ready. So I brought in local employers, colleges, recruiters to absolutely you can take pictures of that when I did it I um like gave an email transcription of um me and the Tuscaloosa Recycling Center we were going back and forth on them coming and donating they they did some speaking at us we took the kids on a field trip and it was just like a correspondence back and forth I gave that whole email as as something so yes you can absolutely show that with you can snap pictures and show they came that's evidence um, when completing component four, all of these pages are created as one huge Google file and then uploaded. Are we uploading each? No, they are all created as one portfolio. Yes, there will be sections. If I'm not mistaken, there's sections. Um, I'm looking at page 16. You're going to have one, two, three. You're going to have five different PDFs. Okay. Um, and it tells you that I'm looking, we're going to get to this in just a second. Page 16 here, it tells you how you're submitting. So there's gonna be five different PDFs. Um, one we're about to cover. Um, the second one is your knowledge of students. So those four pages we went over at the start, that's one PDF. Um, 15 pages for the assessment is your third PDF. You're participating in learning communities. That's your fourth. And then your written commentary that we're going to get. So it's going to be five different PDFs that you're putting in. So all of these things that we're covering individually, they go to get, they, they will go individually. Your student need and professional need, they are actually part of the learning community. So all, um, what is that? Two, three, all six pages will go together. Does that answer that question? Hey, but I'm looking at library and it says like under participation in, in learning communities, I must have put two files, one for professional learning and one for student need. 
Yeah, you'll have two different files, in, but it's, so, well, yes. So mine says that too. So it'll be two different files. Yeah. But I think it, that when you, my, what I was saying is when you go into the platform, you will click a link that says participation in learning communities and you'll upload those, those two files in that link. If that makes sense. Like even on your assessment, mine says I uploaded three, three files, but they all went under that same link of generating and use of assessment. Does that make sense, Jennifer? Yes, sorry, I just was thinking it's gonna be more than five PDFs because oh, of the yeah. different files. I'm sorry, yeah, five, it's five links. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Um, okay, so, so there's a couple ways you can upload. Yeah, PDF, um, you can do that. In just a second, I'm going to show you on my tips page that it tells you to be careful with Google Docs because when you go from Google Docs to the PDF or Google Docs to Word, it will actually make it longer. So what we've noticed is that if you type in Google Docs and then you because because National Board is not going to take a Google Doc, you're going to end up having to copy it over into a Word or convert it to a PDF. When you do that, if you have like 12 pages exactly on your Google Doc, when you convert it, it makes it like 13 or 14 pages. So we advise not to use Google Docs. We always advise to use Word to start with. And when you do that, if you do use Word instead, it's super easy to scan in your evidence and just click it in as another page, right? Or click it in as an image, as another page. Um, so you can do that, or you can print off your Word document stick your evidence where you want it and then scan the whole thing back in. You can do that too, okay? <clears throat> Any other questions before we move on to the next section? All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is our bookends. There are two things we have not talked about. One goes at the very, very beginning and one goes at the very, very end. The bookend at the beginning is your contextual information sheet. It is the first form they provide you, okay? And it is actually labeled contextual information sheet. Um, it's gonna ask you just some, these questions, all right? Briefly identify the type of school. You want these to be very short, very to the point, very, because you only get one page and half the page is taken up with the questions. So you don't get much room to write, okay? So what I tell people is that for this first question, the scorers should be able to close their eyes and actually envision your school. So for instance, I would use words for mine, like my school is split off into three hallways, a sixth, seventh and eighth grade hallway. Um, on the other half of the school or our electives. So the score could come right in my school and say, oh, these are the three hallways of the grades. There's your electives. And so, you know, like we're departmentalized, we're in pods, we've got two pods of things. So you're just describing that kind of thing. Um, then there are brackets where it says briefly describe your grade, age level, number of students. Those are just one number, grades. I teach seventh grade. All, all I put was seventh grade, age levels, 11 through 13. Number of students taught daily, 102, or whatever it is. It's just numbers, okay? Quick and to the point. That last question is where you're really going to use most of your space. It says, what information about your teaching context do you believe would be important? This is other stuff, okay? State or district mandates, staff info, schedule of classes, technology access, right? We always recommend, if this is not your first um, component, you probably have filled this out already for another component. We recommend do not copy and paste. Of course, some of it is going to be the exact same, the number of students or the age levels or the grades, right? But when you get down to your extra information, there might be some from one of the other ones that you filled out that don't really pertain to what you're about to write about. So we recommend not to, to copy and paste. We recommend to make it as unique as possible. Does that mean you're not going to have some of the same stuff? No, absolutely not. You're going to, but try to make it as unique as possible. So that's the very first page. And then the at the end bookend is your written commentary. This is going to be 12 pages based on questions they are asking you. So when you go to your instructions, there's a whole page of italicized questions that you're going to be answering. OK, 
okay? We always recommend with this that you copy all the questions and put them in your Word doc, and then you're answering each question through there because each group of questions has questions. So each section has questions. So you're gonna end up with four different groups. So you have the knowledge of students. They recommend two pages on that. There are four sections or four sub questions within that set, okay? Um, but there are a lot of questions there that you're answering. We always recommend making your questions like blue and you write in black or making the questions red and you write in black so that you can go after each question mark and actually answer. Um, generation of assessment data use, um, they suggest five questions or five pages, learning communities two, reflection, they recommend three. You can, of course, alter that, but it needs to be 12 pages total. And you might not use all of it. I say use all of it, but um, this does not have to be your typical writing style. You can use numbers, contractions, bullets, shorthand. You can italicize bold things. In fact, we recommend that anytime you throw their standards back at them, you do bold that. If you find something in your standards that they're saying over and over again, bold it when you write in there, give it right back to them. Answer just the question. You're going to, you're going to go through. I know when I did, I got 12 pages. By the time I got done, I had 22 pages. I was like, oh my gosh, I got to cut 10. So then you go back and you start realizing, okay, I can take the word students out and put SS. That takes some stuff. Make sure you don't have two spaces at the end of a sentence. Um, and then you just start cutting. Okay, well, this doesn't really answer the question. Let's take it out. I can merge these things together. Let's take this out. So don't worry about the pages at the start. Um, just write and then cut later. Here I've put this, what do you submit? I told you on page 16 of your instructions. I think it's 16 for everybody. It, it might be page 15 or 17, but for most people it's page 16. It tells you exactly what you're submitting. One page for the contextual info sheet, four pages for KOS, 15 pages for assessment, and I've broken it down here for you. Total of 38 pages at the end. All right, and then I told you there's an overall theme of reflection. I put this here, not as its own piece, but as an overall theme, because guys, you should be reflecting throughout the whole thing, okay? Anywhere you can reflect in your written commentary, even if it's on your, your knowledge of students, you do it, okay? Um, talk about how you gave, gave a survey to the parents electronically and only four of them did it. Okay, well, what are you gonna do next year? I, when it asks you, I gave this, this survey, but only four of my parents did it electronically. Next year, I'm going to mail it out and make sure they submit it, or I'm going to see them at parent teacher days or, or whatever. I'm going to make sure they fill it, fill it out so that I can get information on my kids. Reflect throughout, not just on the reflection piece of the piece of the written commentary, but throughout all of the written commentary. Okay. And know that things do not have to be perfect. They don't have to always work. Um, just explain why they didn't and what would you do next time? My absolute dear friend, and she'd be with me on this if she was in town um, presenting with me, she tells the story all the time about how she had a student need and she was working with one student and at the end, the kid went down. Like th what she did did not help at all. But she was like, you know what? This is the evidence I have. This is the kid I did. I did great stuff. This kid just didn't grow. And she just wrote about it and explained why he didn't grow and what he's gonna, she's gonna do next time and how she learned. So it's totally fine if what you're doing didn't work. They just wanna see what you're doing and why. And did you grow from it? How will you be scored? There are, uh, There is a rubric at the end of your, um, your directions and it tells you level one, two, three, or four. Of course you want a four. Um, and I put the main verbiage that you're gonna see in this. I'm not gonna go over the rubric because that's something you guys can read on your own, but I would highly anticipate you're shooting for the four. So when you're writing, don't even look at one, two, and three. Look at four and go through and say, did I do this? Yep, check. Did I do this? Yep, check. Oh, I didn't hit that. How can I be more clear and consistent or, or whatever that might be, right? So make sure that you're looking at that rubric. It is at the end. Um, and then I've just got some tips. So writing tip. There is, um, 
I know there's a lot of things for you to print off. You've got your standards, you've got your instructions, you've got your core propositions, which we'll cover in a second. And then we recommend printing off the general portfolio instructions. That's something completely different. And it is very descriptive. It tells you about how you should be writing, words you should be saying, um, just gives you some general information, talks a lot about the copyright stuff and, and issues with there. So make sure you do that. If you know today you're starting comp four at the beginning at, for next school year, get your students released forms that day, like hand them out with your syllabus and say, I need this. Um, Cause you're gonna need the student release form signed by the student and the parent. If you know you're doing, if you are starting out and you're just starting out, this is your first component you're doing. I always give the advice to read your standards three times. I know it's a lot of material. Mine were 92 pages. First time over the summer, read it, just read for leisure. Second time, read with the highlighter and highlight every time they're using the same words or verbiage. And the third time, go to the side with a pen or pencil and write down what you currently are doing or what you want to do in your classroom that would relate to what they're saying. And then go back to these standards profusely. Um, be ready to start that first day. Comp four is gonna take you a long time. Start on day one. Summative assessment should assess all unit goals. Um, don't use last names of kids, use the first name or their initials. Um, show a variety of things. I already told you about the warnings on Google Docs. These are just reminders. Um, submissions monitored for plagiarism against Atlas. So <clears throat> make sure you're not copying anybody else's. Um, make sure you put your candidate number on the top of every, every page, even on your written commentary, put it up at the top as a header. Um, make sure also when you do those forms, those forms you cannot alter. You are only typing in the brackets. So you cannot delete anything. You can't take anything away. You can only type on those. I also put the five core propositions up here um, to remember that you need to always be relating back to those. Teachers are committed to students and their learning. Teachers know the subjects. Teachers are responsible for class management and, and student monitoring. You're constantly thinking about your practices and learning from others and your members of communities. So make sure that you are um, remembering that. The last thing before I stop for final questions is there is a video that I want to show you guys. It's really quick, it's like three minutes. If um, Holly will put that up for me, I'll stop sharing. It's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically of the national board process and having these four components is you get to pick and choose which components make the most sense for you to engage with in a given school year. So component four is how you impact student learning through assessment. Component four is an opportunity to look at your, your classroom data, to figure out how it is that you're going to design your instruction based off of your student needs, and then how you're gonna assess them and share that information with others. Teaching is a team sport. You're really assessing on what you do and you are reflecting on how you communicate those uh, assessment results with the most important stakeholders that we have, our students, their families, our teachers. And using their colleagues to have those rich conversations about what are you doing and why are you doing it. Who are you as an assessor of your students and how do you teach your students to assess themselves? Evidence, formative data, summative data, portfolio data. But the beauty of Component 4 is that we finally have a chance to talk about the work that we do, the collaboration that we do with one another around the only thing that matters in this profession, and that is student learning. This is my 12th year as an educator, and I stay committed to board certification. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so I have a couple of um, questions in the chat box about scoring, and I wanna address that real quick, okay? So with the scores, your scores are 
collaborative. It's all put together. So um, here's what you have to have. You have to have a 1.75 on a component before it's considered not really usable, meaning you have to have a, a 1.75 on comp one overall comp one. And then with comp two, three, and four together, it has to average a 1.75. Okay. Now I say those, those are really low. If you get those, chances are you're not going to hit your 110 that you need. Each component is worth a different percentage. So component one is worth 40. Component two and four are worth 15. So the one we're talking about right now is worth 15%, okay? And then component three is worth that other 30, all right? So one and three are, are, um, are your big ticket items, okay? Four is the perfect score. But just because you, like, I made a four on four, but I did not make a four on anything else. But I still certified my first time with like 117 points, okay? So you don't have to make a four on a component to certify, you, what they say is, I think if you were to make a 2.75 on every single component, you get your 110 points, okay? Um, but chances are you're going to score higher than that on something, and you might score lower than that on something, okay? So, um, and remember component one, you can just take a piece of, let's say you do really well on the the multiple choice piece, but you don't do well on the written component piece. Well, you can just take the written component piece to get on comp one. So it really all goes together. I know because I sat in your place three years ago when that was the answer that was given to me. I was like, what in the world are you talking about? Okay, you're really not going to see it until you see it. Meaning if you have already submitted a component and you get your scores in December, then it's going to start clicking. Oh, okay. Well, I made a three on component two and a three on component three. So here's what I need for one and four to certify because there's a calculator that you can go in and look at. Okay. So once you do your scores, your, your number score has some points attached to it. And you really just need a 110 overall. And again, they're percentage based. And so it, it gets really difficult with the scoring. Um, I would recommend not, if this is your first component you're submitting or your first time you're submitting anything, I would not worry about the scores right now, okay? I would worry mostly about making sure you're writing what they're asking, you're looking at your rubrics and you're shooting for that four. Because if you're shooting for that four, even if you don't reach it, you're probably gonna reach a pretty high pretty high score because that's what you're shooting for, okay? So I wouldn't concern yourself too, too much about the scores. Now, if you've already submitted some pieces and you've already gotten some scores back or you get some scores in December, then go to that calculator and start playing around. But don't worry too, too much about the scores. And each certificate area should be um, the set. I mean, all certificate areas are weighted the same. So component one is 40% for everybody. Component two and four are 15% for everybody. And component three is 30% for everybody. I have a question. Yes, go for it. Um, I would like some more clarification on the core um, standards. While you were writing, did you go through and list those and say, as standard such and such exemplifies teachers? So let me make sure I understand. You said core and okay. standards. You mean your five core propositions or do you mean your national board standards? The propositions. I'm sorry. Okay. So there are five core propositions. No, I personally didn't go through those. Um, so I'm going to bring those five core propositions back up because those are just yeah. something that should be like a, um, those should be like in the back of your head as you're writing what you're, what you're doing. So if you are here, what I did, I did go back and say, because the standards will say something like your actual standards will say an accomplished teacher assesses students for rigor and understanding. So I might have said this assessment made sure my kids knew rigor, highlight and bold, uh, uh, the content, because those were the exact words from the standard, but I didn't do that for core propositions. You can, absolutely, but more than likely, all of your, uh, not even more than likely, this is fact, all of your standards are going to meet one of your five core propositions anyways, so that, that wording is kind of similar in both areas, because okay. some of are going to be 
being committed to students and their learning. Some of your standards are going to be teachers or learning or members of learning communities. So as long as you're like using your standard words, you're probably using your core proposition words anyways. Okay. And as long as we are, it's evident that we're committed to our students and their learning, that we're teaching and learning subjects as we go along. Um, we're being responsible, those kind of things. As long as that's evident, we're good. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. Now I would, I highly, I always tell my TCS candidates, if you send me something to read and I do not see some bold words, I'm sending it back to you without reading anything saying, look at your standards. I tell all my candidates that you, you need to have riddled in your written commentary, your standards, whether you bold them or you italicize, like you just need to have their information thrown back at them because that's what they're saying. If you're doing that, it's, it's absolutely what they're looking for, right? I'm going to go, I see that some of y'all are, are thanking me and I greatly appreciate that. I'm going to put this last slide up. We still have two minutes. Well, two minutes, four minutes, four minutes. So if you want to stay and you have more questions, please do. This is my info. And I wanted to show you this last statement. So only 3% of the teachers in the country are national board teachers. So when you're looking at your component, does your component, is it exceptional? Is it is it part of that 3% or is it part of that 97% of other classrooms that you see across the, the US? Like that's a good way to think about it, okay? Is, is this exceptional or is it just your normal stuff? So make sure you're looking at that. And then this is my info. Please reach out to me if you need it. There's my email. I give you my cell phone. Um, you know, shoot me a text if you need something. Like I said, I can help you on anything, but component four is my bread and butter. Um, my husband actually said this morning, I can't believe you're not a nervous wreck speaking at a conference. And I was like, this is comp four. I can do it in my sleep. If this was comp two, I'd probably be biting my nails. But um, comp four is, is totally my thing. So if you need something, please, please, please reach out. Um, Y'all have been great. And please stay. I'm, I mean, my next session is not till one. So if you have questions, I'm here to answer them.